Hello and welcome to the JW Thoughts channel. We are continuing the Convention Crusade. No. No. Ah! Yes, we are back for the Saturday afternoon session. I think this one is going to be a lot of interviews, so look forward to picking some of these apart and seeing any juicy details that they have to offer. Uh, before we get started, don't forget to drop a like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and let's do this thing. Is it possible to maintain our peace when dealing with intense trials and pressures? How does Jehovah care for our needs when we are in distress? The following video will introduce us to brothers and sisters who have been blessed by Jehovah with peace. The theme is how our brothers are enjoying peace despite opposition, illness, economic problems, and natural disasters. Oh yes, no convention would be complete without some interviews. Now, when you attended a real life IRL a convention, the interviews were very ubiquitous. It was seemed like every other talk had some type of interview where they talk about someone and they were in a difficult situation and how Jehovah had blessed them to work their way out of it. But so far in this convention, we haven't seen too much of that. So I guess uh, let's jump headlong into the interview section. As long as we live in Satan's world, all of us will face situations that can rob us of our peace. Regaining that peace can be difficult, but not impossible. In this video, we will hear from three sisters and two couples who will speak candidly about their trials and how they struggle to cope with them. But in spite of what they have endured, please take note of their smiles, their joy, what they did to regain or maintain their peace. And take special note of how Jehovah helped them. Yes, take note of their smiles. This is going to be an important uh, facet of these interviews because anyone, no matter what they're feeling like, might just be able to go, I feel great, even though they're dying inside. And as someone that was a Jehovah's Witness for most of my life, I know exactly the feeling of smiling on the outside, but dying on the inside. So when he says, take note of the smiles, it's just a little bit hard to swallow knowing how much I smiled outwardly but was hurting internally. The governing body knows that many of you are suffering circumstances not unlike the ones we will hear about, and they trust that the examples in this video will help each of you to maintain your peace as you endure various trials. Yes, gone are the days of Jehovah knows what you're going through. Now, move Jehovah to one side and just enter the governing body. Yes, the governing body knows what you're going through. And they hope that these examples will strengthen you. Brothers and sisters all over the world are facing natural disasters, economic collapse, illness, persecution. Despite all that, they keep joy and peace. I can learn a lot from them. My name is Antoinette. I live here in Las Vegas, Nevada with my super mom and my troublemaking sister. Family and friends have always been important to me. As a child, I lived with my mom and dad, and I was very close to my dad's side of the family. It was very uh, loving, unified, and fun. I was pretty happy. Um, 
But I already was starting to feel the effects of my cancer. We just didn't know what it was, really. One day, I, I was okay, and then the next day, I started feeling bad, you know? Shoutouts to Antoinette. This is the best speaker that we've seen in the convention so far. Her ability to seem uh, candid and honest and sincere in her delivery of this portion of the convention is genuinely refreshing because we have just moved from robot to robot to governing body member to another robot. And now we get to see someone that is demonstrating that, hey, you can get in front of a camera and not talk like a Jehovah's Witness. Now, obviously, what's going to be happening here is a horrible, horrible propaganda piece and that they're using this little girl's um, suffering in order to further the Watchtower agenda. But I just did, wanted to give her a big shout out because she does speak extremely coherently and it is very engaging to listen to. In my childhood, I played in the usual game. I would catch insects put them in a jar, and then bring them home. Then I would get books, such as the Criminal Procedural Code, open them up and start judging one of the books. I would play the role of investigator and judge at the same time. Yeah, we do hear about it, and it is a pretty common uh, symptom of a severe conduct disorder. So if kids have conic problems that are kind of getting in the more severe area, there will be this uh, abuse towards animals. And it's even a symptom in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I was born into a family where everyone, starting with my grandparents, was either wearing an officer's uniform or a judge's robe. That's why I had this strong sense of justice. But in 1989, my mother was in a tragic car accident and uh, she got severe, she got severe burns on her face, hands and body. And then my father, at seeing my mom's condition, decided to leave us. Yeah. And it was at that moment, I guess, that my world my ideals, they crumbled. I, as a little kid, I always wanted like one big happy family. Once we moved to New York for my treatment, I no longer had that big family bond anymore. What I was feeling back then in New York was just sadness. Never really peace. I do find it very disturbing that the Watchtower seems completely comfortable with using all of the human suffering to further their agenda in order to trap people into their ridiculous belief systems. And it, just when you see examples of, you know, Antoinette that has cancer and dealing with that, and this guy having his mom go having a horrible car accident and then his dad just up and leaves as a result of it it's just really heart-wrenching uh, situations that they're presenting and no doubt they're going to position themselves as this sort of jesus figure and they're the ones with the hidden jitsu that will keep you alive and sane and happy and maintaining your peace throughout all of these ridiculously difficult situations well, here in California, we're used to fires. But when I got the call to evacuate that morning, I never knew by that evening the whole town of Paradise would be gone. Just before the fire, we had the needs of the congregation where they instructed us of what to do in the case of a disaster. 
I had the truck full of gas. I had my go bag ready. And I had a map of where I was going. I was ready. The brothers also in their instructions said to obey the traffic instructors. The instructor told us to turn right, and I didn't want to turn right, but they said obey them, so I turned right, though I thought it'd be really bad. <laughs> it is interesting, too, how they're not only making these people, by doing these interviews, relive their tragic experiences in order to encourage the worldwide brotherhood, but also they're actually reliving it Literally, it's like, okay, well, can you get in the truck? Can we get a shot of you with your go bag, reading your instructions, driving away in the truck? Uh, so now she has to go and relive the whole experience with an entire film crew. It's very odd to me. The smoke got darker and darker. And finally it got black you couldn't see anything. My mom always told me I've always been a caregiver ever since I was a little girl. It was just part of who I was. I don't like to see people suffer. It's um, very difficult for me. I remember, <laughs> I remember when I started first started working as a nurse, <laughs> I would always cry. I cried, literally I cried every day that I had to go to work. Not only was I overwhelmed being a new nurse, but also um, I was battling my depression. In 2017, I was the treasurer for a prestigious bank in Nicaragua, and I was the father of a one-year-old son. We were very happy. But then I lost my job. So I said, I have the experience, and Jehovah will help me find another job, something similar. And I kept looking for jobs, but doors kept closing. I felt very tense. It made me feel very useless. Like, um, I can't even provide for my family. It was something very difficult for me. One thing I'm reminded of as I'm watching these interviews is that, you know, yes, we do a lot of poking fun and have a bit of a giggle at all of the crazy Watchtower teachings, but there are human beings at the core of this organization. There are human beings that are going through very difficult, stressful, worrisome challenges. And when you see these examples of you know people facing financial hardships and health difficulties and natural disasters, your heart really goes out to people in the organization because not only are they dealing with the same things that you know us on the outside of the organization are dealing with, but they're also dealing with the added pressure of being a Jehovah's Witness. Earlier in the Saturday session, you know, they talk about how important it is to make sure you're fine-tuning your preaching and how you need to be going to all of these different meetings in order to essentially do nothing because it's not going to actually improve your preaching work. They're, the organization, the governing body, is constantly putting more pressure on Jehovah's Witnesses to be better preachers, to be better teachers, to take care of other people in the congregation, to worry about these congregation responsibilities, to try and do building projects. And you have all of this added pressure on top of just trying to get through the day. Someone might be, you know, dealing with crippling depression. Watchtower isn't doing anything to help that. No, they're actually making things worse. You're going through financial difficulties. Watchtower isn't doing anything to make that better. They are making it worse. So my heart really goes out to people that are in the organization having to suffer through not just what everyone has to deal with 
in the with the craziness that is living a life on planet Earth, but they also have to deal with those things while they're being controlled by a manipulative cult. Growing up, I wondered, why does the Supreme Judge, God, allow injustice and suffering? And inside of me, I had this need to restore justice. It was such a burning desire within me. And with that in mind, I moved to Russia to stay with my sister. She started to study the Bible and was overflowing with the truth. We talked for hours till late into the night. So that's when my special relationship with Jehovah began. That's when I, I got a taste of what it's like to have a caring father. It had been a while since I was able to feel that. My baptism day was very exciting. The spiritual family I inherited was very vast. Um, I, you can instantly feel the love. I got baptized and it seemed like miracles happened one after the other. And this is a real problem with being a Jehovah's Witness. When you fully go turbo mode and think that, yes, now I have the protection of an all powerful superhero that lives in a different dimension and he is doing miracles for me in my life, even though that's not demonstrable, it causes delusion. And then it, it can be something as silly as, oh, I, I didn't get a speeding ticket even though I was speeding. Jehovah must, he really got me out of that situation. You could be sitting at a stoplight doing something like looking at your phone and texting and the light turns green and you don't go and then you realize it turns green and then someone runs the red light and you think, wow, Jehovah protected me because of I had to send that text message. You can find any silly, stupid thing to assign a supernatural cause to once you have fully committed to the JW way of thinking and no doubt we're going to see examples of that. We had a great life. And then the persecution started with Brother Christensen. And then there was a ripple effect of arrests, one after the other. Then it was our turn. In June of 2018, a huge group of armed men came to us, to our home. They represented the ideals of my childhood. But now these people, this judicial system became the source of injustice to me. I was sitting in a cage the same way my bugs used to be in a jar. <laughs> I guess I felt like they did. In your head, at that moment, when you hear the verdict that you'll stay in prison, it's like you've been knocked unconscious. You've been hit in the head with something, and there's just a ringing sound in your ears. And so I was taken away in handcuffs. Of course, <laughs> I wasn't in the best mood. But then, the doors of the elevator opened up and in front of us. A lot of brothers and sisters clapping their hands as hard as they could. And some were crying, but not crying because they felt sorry for me. They cried because they loved us and because they were proud of us. That's what always happens when you're just about to lose all your strength. Jehovah does that something for you that gives you a second wind. And so 
the applause, the love, the tears, the shouts, hang in there, everything will be okay. They, they gave me a <sighs> second wind and with renewed strength, I could run the next part of the race. One of the guards was so surprised that he said, now that's some support you've got. <laughs> yeah. It is incredible to me that they will put forth this person's example of being willing to go to prison for their beliefs when the longest tenured governing body member, uh, Garrett Loesch, won't even show up to a court in order to testify uh, defending his his involvement with being a governing body member that directs the Watchtower organization. No, instead of even showing up just to testify, to, to, to be deposed, he wrote a letter and said, you know what, I've never been a member of the Watchtower organization. I don't control Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't control Watchtower. Watchtower has no control over me. So uh, this really isn't relevant to me. And yes, I get it. It might be a legal technicality. But is this man trying to find any legal technicality that he can in order to get out of his prison sentence? Is he trying to grasp at any little tiny technicality? A technicality, mind you, that if this man said, if this man said the same words that Garrett Loesch did, he would maybe be free from, you know, going to prison, but he would immediately uh, be disassociated as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and shunned by all of those people that showed up clapping for him and crying tears. He would immediately be shunned and no one would ever talk to him until he was found sufficiently repentant. So this fake clapping, this fake love that he's experiencing in this moment, it blows me away that Garrett Loesch can sit on his throne and watch all of this human suffering, use it as a propaganda piece in order for people to support him and his lifestyle and to to build more buildings so that way they can expand their real estate and publishing empire it blows me away that he can sit there in comfort and not be able to put these two things together hmm i kind of sort of lied to uh, a court in order to get out of even showing up just to defend our position and our uh, practices when it comes to the safeguarding of children. Yeah, I kind of lied in order to get out of that. But look at these great examples of people that aren't willing to compromise their faith. They aren't willing to compromise their loyalty to this organization. It's so truly... Without friends, I would be very lonely. I would constantly be focusing on my illness. The day I met Marissa was at a convention. She's a really great friend, a spiritual friend. When she takes me to my hospital appointments, we would eat out. I think food is just the common language between everyone, you know? When you talk about food, you know, like, ah, oh, yes, we have something to talk about, you know? I would be excited when she would take me to my hospital appointment. She always makes me laugh, you know? She always has, helps me have a good time no matter what. Again, friends uh, really help encourage me. Can we get her to be the next governing body member? I think the organization would see massive changes and massive improvements, uh, and it would improve the lives of ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses if uh, if this a girl became the next governing body member. So uh, I, what do we do? Like we hashtag it or something? Try and get it popular? I don't know. Proverbs 17.17 17 says, A true friend shows love at all times and is a brother who is born for times of distress. And I have seen this come true in my life. When I lost my job at the bank, well, I felt very depressed, troubled, tense. And I have a good friend that I can talk to. And when I told him how I was feeling, he told me, look, Miguel, don't look for the same line of work. Maybe what you need to do is make a change in your life 
why don't you find some simple work outside of an office for a time that can help you to keep your eye simple and allow you to provide for your family. I watch my wife make bread for our family. And one day I told her, I'm gonna make that bread, but not for our family. I'm gonna make it to sell. So she told me, no, are you crazy? It was a big change, right? From having a position at a bank and handling a lot of money to selling on the street. So I told her, look, I'm gonna put this hat on. And I put like a chef's hat on. And I told her, I'll be back in less than an hour, whether I sell or not. And that's what happened. And to her surprise, I came back without any bread. So when I got ready to leave the second time to sell, she said, okay, go, but uh, leave the hat here. <laughs> I also started to iron clothes for people in their homes. And it looked strange because normally where we live, that type of work is done by a woman. But for a man to go and iron clothes at someone's home, <laughs> you don't see that. But I didn't wanna just sit back with my arms crossed and see what would happen. No, I had to put my, my hands to work to earn a living for my family. It's funny to me that they can say, oh, normally this job would be done by a woman, so to see a man doing it was quite surprising. You'll never get the opposite with Watchtower, will you? You'll never see, well, traditionally, uh, elders are men, but hey, you know what? This uh, woman, she did an amazing job being, a, being an elder, and how great is that? So you'll only see it on one side, like, oh, look, a man can humble himself, but a woman can't elevate herself through her own capacity and ability and inherent talent uh, to get a job done. No, it can only be a man that humbles himself or elevates himself. It, it, it's just a really goofy, silly dynamic. Uh, I, I suppose they do this kind of, sort of, when they talk about like w women that work in the construction field and they're like operating heavy machinery and things, but that's not unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. Like that's just a regular old thing. Like, yeah, it might be newer in the last few decades, but it's not like a brain blaster or anything. But you never see them like, wow, I can't believe she has this position within Watchtower. Nope. I was feeling so sad. I really needed Jehovah's help to figure out what was going on with me. And I remember the 2009 article about depression came out. And I realized, okay, Jehovah, you're telling me this is what I have. So now that I realize I have this, I got to figure out how I can manage it. So I changed my eating habits. I started exercising a lot more. I realized that exercising and eating healthy really, really did help. Also, I made a journal and I made different sections of the different aspects of my depression that I dealt with. Each section, I would put scriptures, I would put articles and the illustrations, the pictures. They speak, they speak a lot without saying anything. Jehovah hears us. Jehovah cares. Uh, I do have a bit of a question, so if anyone out there on the internet has access to this original hard copy of this article, I would be curious, because in the digital version it does uh, mention seeking appropriate medical uh, help and advice. So I don't know if that was in the printed form or if that's an adjustment that they've made. Because in this little piece, she doesn't say, well, yeah, I, I went and I got help from a trained professional to deal with this. She just mentions eating better and getting some exercise. So I, I would be a little bit curious to know if they did change the digital version versus the, the hard copy. So if anyone out there on the internet uh, knows and wants to comment down below, I'd very much appreciate it. 
After some time in prison, they transferred me to a different cell. In it were inmates who followed the orders of the investigators. They did everything they could to other inmates to make life unbearable. Why did they do this? To break a person. So that they would start to collaborate with the investigators, confess to everything, and then be able to get transferred to another area. Psalm 37.3 Trust in Jehovah and do what is good. I said, Jehovah, please help me to stay loyal to you. Please help me. My prayers were really simple. Actually, like two words, Jehovah help, Jehovah help, Jehovah help. Despite how they treated me, when I dealt with others, I tried to treat them with kindness. This guy goes full Lloyd Braun mode from Seinfeld and just says, Serenity now, serenity now, serenity now. Yeah, I don't know how that's actually going to work out for you. These people, they made life uncomfortable, unbearable. But when they were treated kindly, they started to soften. They began to treat me differently. When I was being transferred out of that cell, the inmate that ran the area called me over to him and said, come sit beside me. And I sat down. Then he said, if anybody in this prison touches you, tell them that I'll come looking for him. <laughs> then he said, get his things. He told the other prisoners. The cell doors opened and the guards saw a crowd of inmates grabbing my things and putting them out into the hallway. I left the cell without having to carry a thing. <laughs> the guard quietly closed the door. And before the inmates returned to their cells, they even said goodbye, hugged me and said, hang in there, you're gonna be okay. They went into the cell and the guard closed the door and asked me, boy, how long have you been in there? <laughs> I said, three weeks. <laughs> he said, well, normally people leave this cell beaten up and they're thrown out by the other inmates. They have to carry their own things, and that's if the other inmates haven't thrown their stuff out the door. He couldn't believe what had just happened. That's Jehovah. Now, I don't know about this particular example, but I do know that Watchtower does cook their stories. They try and dial everything up to 11, to make it seem more supernatural, like a, a really grandiose thing that happened because of God's divine intervention. So I don't know for a fact that, you know, whether or not what he's saying is, is true, but I would be curious to know like what he actually said versus what was translated. Those two things would actually make me pretty curious to know uh, like what his actual words were because when they're doing these stories and it's someone that is a non-English speaker and maybe there's they release this in a different language and I'm just a bozo and don't know about it but when they do these uh, stories like this they have someone dubbing it over so like all of that emotion and the tears and the gasp you know that's all a voice actor doing it they're like and I was just so happy that God he helped me like full amber heard style and i just want to know like what he actually said and if it's as fantastic as they're making it out to seem here exercising changing my diet the publications journaling that was my lifeline that really actually helped me um for a long time but it came to a point where it stopped working as effectively I remember getting ready, f dressed for the meeting. And I was fine getting dressed for a meeting, about to walk out the door, but I couldn't. There was this overwhelming fear that came over me and overwhelming sadness that came over me. And I just lost it. I just started crying. I couldn't get, I couldn't get myself together. It was bad. It got really bad. My depression 
got really bad. So it was very difficult for me to approach the brothers to ask them for help. But at that time, I knew that if I didn't, that something bad would happen. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna ask for a shepherding call with my brothers because I never talked about my depression with, with the elders at all. This was my first time speaking with them. And there was one um, brother, one of the elders, who also battled depression. And he suggested, have you thought about seeking medical help? Seeking professional help was something I never wanted to do. I thought that I didn't need to do it. Um, but sometimes there comes a point where you need additional help. And what you're doing is not enough. In this world, it make, they make you feel like it's a bad thing, that depression is a dirty word, or seeking medical help is something that you don't do. But I realized also that seeking medical help was part of my being able to worship Jehovah effectively. That's me doing my part. Not everyone needs to take that step, but for me, this is what I need to do. And I'm glad I did it because the fact that I've never think I've ever felt this good in my life. Oh my goodness, it's a miracle! Except that it's not. She went and got medical, professional medical assistance, and what do you know, she was able to feel better than she's ever felt at any point in her entire life. Wow, that's a real brain blaster here. Now, one thing that I'll just throw out there into the internet land is my experience with talking to elders about depression and what to do about it. If they said, hey, it's okay to seek uh, professional help, but, and, and it was a giant conjunction out there, but make sure they are going to be respectful of your beliefs. Make sure they are going to respect that you are a Jehovah's Witness. So there's like a caveat to there, like, hey, I know you might be going through this really difficult time with your mental health, but make sure you don't actually explore all of the reasons that might be causing this. Make sure you just limit it to other factors because surely we don't want you going and poking around and seeing, hey, maybe this belief system, maybe the way I'm living my life because it's centered around Watchtower is not healthy. Maybe the cognitive dissonance and the sexual repression is all lambasting your brain on a daily basis. No, don't, don't go down that rabbit hole because we wouldn't want you to leave the organization. And uh, I, I don't know what her experience was, but I'm assuming it's something a little bit similar. About a year later, we were released. But my wife and I understood that they could put me back in prison again. So we needed to use the time until then to the full in the best way possible. So what did we do? Psalm 119, 165. Abundant peace belongs to those who love your law. We had family worship, read the Bible, and prayed together. That's how I spent my four months of freedom. Then I was put into prison for three years. When they told me about my cancer being gone, I was really happy, I was ecstatic. I was like, finally, I'm gonna get to do normal things that a uh, kid my age should be able to do. I don't need to be afraid or anxious anymore. Unfortunately, I did relapse again. And uh, basically right now, my present condition is there's nothing really more to do. They're just waiting to let nature take its course, basically. Um, and that's it. Then harmony with Ephesians 
chapter 4, verse 26, I had to let myself process the news and let myself be sad, angry. Um, let yourself feel those feelings. Do not try to repress them, but you can control your thoughts and your actions. Pretty much my whole life, uh, it has revolved around my illness, but I learned how to shift focus I just don't focus on myself all the time. I focus on others. There are trials that are different, but just as hard. You read the stories on JW.org in the newsroom. The Russian brothers and sisters, I, I, I pray for them constantly because um, they're going through a very tough time. Watchtower is just truly shameless. We've seen before examples where they have used for propaganda films and articles the death of children as a direct result of their adherence to watchtower rules and regulations and they're held up as examples they're they're praised and here we have just an example again of them being shameless hey look at this this well-spoken uh, plucky smart uh, happy it would appear at least in the video that we can see a little girl who is basically awaiting the inevitable she 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 knows it she's made peace with it and and her last moments aren't going to be spent you know trying to eke out some happiness in life they're going to be spent with a lie her last moments are going to be being lied to because Watchtower is making these promises and that they can't keep. Watchtower is making these claims that they can't prove. And no doubt her parents have been infected with it and it's going to, they'll continue to stay in the organization as a result of this tragedy. And it just really rubs me the wrong way when you think about the, the human suffering that happens within this organization. And then we have the other example of someone, hey, I'm finally out of prison. And what do I do with that four months that I'm out of prison? Family worship, reading the Bible, prayer, all things related to being a Jehovah's Witness. He can't just go out and and go spend time with his, his family and his wife. He can't just go out and be a, a regular person that... I don't know, cooks nice meals, goes and visits interesting places, reads books in order to expand his horizons and his understanding of the world and the universe. No, he will spend his time with his head fully buried up Watchtower's ass. And it's so sad because he is taking a stand for his beliefs, and yet the governing body members, they will never take a stand for their beliefs. It, when challenged, if they if they are challenged by a million people to have a public debate, e even a public debate, no harm will come to you. They will never stand up for their beliefs. And when they are challenged, as we saw with Jeffrey Jackson at the Royal Commission, when they are challenged, what do they do? They they turn into wet noodles and retreat. Well, are you guys the spokespersons for God? Well, that would be presumptuous to say. Does the Bible have female judges? Uh, I, uh, I'd have to get back to you on that one. I don't know. Oh, but I'm an expert in translation. The examples go on and on of the governing body not being willing to stand up for their own beliefs. And yet, here they are highlighting and using as examples of faith people that stand up. It's yeah, sorry for the more solemn, solemn mood. <clears throat> so sorry for a different vibe and feel to this video. Uh, this Saturday morning part two is mostly these experiences. And a lot of these experiences are kind of heartbreaking and sad when you really think about it just from a empathetic human standpoint. It's hard to get mad or poke fun at these people because they are not the ones that are in charge. They are not the ones that are making these decisions with full volition of the totality 
and history of Watchtower practice, doctrine, and how they operate. And, and without that knowledge, how can you say you are making an informed choice? If you don't have an in-depth knowledge, you genuinely can't say, oh, no, I, make, I, I was there. I used to tell people, no, this is my decision. I've researched this. I truly believe this. And it wasn't true because it couldn't be true because I didn't have all of the information necessary to make that informed choice. And seeing all of these people suffering in these ways is just bothersome to me. I'm... There is definitely more happiness in giving than receiving. And in our situation, this proved true. I would say this, this really helps to relieve your pain. If you focus on yourself, your pain gets worse. When you focus on others and on their problems, your pain lessens, diminishes. So I can just speak from my own experience, but what he's saying here is true up to a point because I was someone in the organization that kind of got a little bit wacky and overboard with just focusing on other people. Sorry, there's a garbage truck going by and not taking enough time to focus on myself and my own uh, mental health and, you know, trying to find things that made me happy because everything was surrounded by how can I do more for Watchtower? How can I do more for my family? How can I do more for people in the congregation? And it was such a grind and I would be completely exhausted all of the time and never taking any moment. So at a certain point, you do need to step back and think about yourself because how useful can you be to someone else if you are dying inside? Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Antoinette, uh, I was so, when I was told that we would talk with each other, this was something very special for me. Uh, same for me too. Uh, when uh, the brothers told me as well uh, about meeting you, I was really excited. Thank you for your prayers on behalf of the brothers in Russia. They are precious. We can learn so much from you. Thank you. Um, it's really uh, nice of you to say that. We've both been through very hard, uh, many hardships. I'm sure prison was super hard. You know, in prison, us brothers had a saying. If you ask, how much worse can it get? You won't have to wait long to find out. Or in other words, when you think, how much worse can it get? For sure, something worse is bound to happen. And when we received our sentence, we thought, well, that's it. That's the worst that could happen. It's truly shocking to me that Watchtower can be more interested in making these videos instead of actually genuinely helping people. They have obviously the power and the resources to genuinely help and affect people's lives in a very positive way. And yet they don't. They spend more time making these videos than they do assisting the people that are keeping them afloat, the people that attend their meetings, the people that con contribute their financial resources to the organization. And it's just, I don't know, this whole thing has just kind of got me in a foul mood. So I'm sorry for the lack of jokes and stuff today, but it's one of those times when Watchtower just kind of pulls at my old heartstrings and I just don't feel funny or excited so yeah and then of course it got worse upon arrival at the prison 
we were beaten up. And for hours we were humiliated. We thought, how much worse can it get? Then the next day we were told, you're going to the punishment cell. We thought, well, how much worse can it get? At first it started with one floor, then it went to another floor, and then the whole entire hospital, every floor had COVID patients. That was some of the hardest nursing that I've ever done in my life, in all of my years of nursing. And we lost a lot of good nurses that were right in the trenches with me, that were in there doing their best. We lost a lot of good people. Even though I was on medication to help me, it still didn't take the depression away. You're like, what's the point? I can't save anyone. I can't, I can't help anyone. It was devastating. It truly, truly was devastating. Now, this is an interesting comment to me because now we have an admission from someone on the broadcasting that recognizes I can't save anyone. There's nothing I can do. I can't help anyone. Whereas normally we hear, but I can offer them you know, this grandiose hope for the future. But now we have someone that's in a position where they do feel helpless, where they feel like there's nothing they can do. Not even reading people a scripture is going to make any difference in their lives. And I just kind of found that little tidbit interesting. And then I decided that I was going to stop asking how worse it could get. Mm -hmm. I asked Jehovah for endurance. And joy for that day, just for that day. And at those times, I just cried to Jehovah, talked to Jehovah about how I'm feeling, and just asked for his peace to help me to deal. I've talked to Jehovah very intimately and personally, but never like I have when I was so alone there. I realized that I was going to die. I asked Jehovah if he saw enough good in me, if he would just resurrect me, that I'd love to be in his new world and see my husband again and my children. And I thanked him so much for the life that I had and I, I felt such a peace that it, it, that I'd never felt before. And then I just knew it was Jehovah getting me out. The obedience, just doing what we were told, it came from Jehovah, and it was so simple that gave him something to bless, and it may have saved my life. I am upset. I am genuinely upset, and um, let me tell you why. So I'm, I'm going to operate under the assumption that this woman was a longtime Jehovah's Witness. I highly doubt that she's going to make it onto the broadcasting or the convention uh, for the entire world to see if she's not a long-term witness. Sorry, ZZ's rolling over on the keyboard. Anyway, I can completely identify with what she is saying here. I understand what it's like to be in a moment where you think you're going to die and the only question you're asking yourself is, did I do enough? Is Jehovah going to think that I'm worthy? And all I, all you do in your life as a Jehovah's Witness, if you're a real gung-ho version of one, which I'm assuming she was and I was as well, is sacrifice your own happiness, sacrifice your own future, sacrifice everything in order to be the best version of a Jehovah's Witness that you possibly can be. And then at this moment where she's like, you face the end, face to face, and it's like, you're still questioning. You've given your entire life, 
everything that you can possibly give to this organization. And yet, in those final moments, there is no peace. There is no satisfaction. There's no, well, at least I can go out knowing I did the right thing. You still have this undeniable fear that, wow, I hope I did enough because how sucky would it be if that few times I masturbated were the thing that separates me from getting into the new world and just dying forever. It's, it's so bad and it's so brutal being a Jehovah's Witness because there's never any end. You can live your entire life in this faithful course, doing everything that Watchtower says. And even in the last moments, as you're, you're thinking, I'm about to die, did I do enough? And then we have this whole stupid thing about, well, I had my little map, but in the map it said to always follow the traffic authorities. So it's like, okay, so the little map you made was made by your elders, but it wasn't very good, and I don't know what ZZ's doing. Um, and it wasn't very good, so then you had to just actually follow the advice of the secular authorities and they're the ones that directed you to a proper course of safe to safety how is that jehovah where is jehovah if she would have followed like her little map that i'm assuming the elders had made and that was the thing that saved her not following the direction of the authorities that would have been more impressive but no she said nuts to the little plan game plan i had i'm just going to follow the secular authorities and i got out of there it, it's so bizarre to me that they would even put this on the convention like it's very dumb and dim-witted in my personal opinion of them to do this I just never wanted to be a burden on people. But the brothers and sisters have come from all over the country to work for this house, the other houses, all of them. They made me feel wanted and they made me feel loved. To feel like Jehovah cared enough to give attention to you I, 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 I just felt so unworthy and here all these people are here taking care of me and you just look at them and then you think, I'm part of this organization, I gotta do better. I gotta be like them and make other people happy. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's always guilt when you're a Jehovah's Witness. You're not even getting help from the organization, by the way. These are just local brothers and sisters that are operating off of their own dime and their own penny. And when she experiences all of this, what is her conclusion? Well, I got to do better. It's like, I'm. you've done enough. You've lived a very long life. You've done enough. Now's your time to just get a little bit of R&R. &R. Uh, keep your mind active and all that good stuff. But now is your time. Please, for the love of God... Just relax a little bit. Don't sit there and beat yourself up and say, no, I gotta do better, I gotta do better now. Ay, ay, ay. When I'm able to help people who are battling depression, I feel like Jehovah's using me in that way. And it makes me happy that I can be of use to Jehovah. It's good to feel, it's, it's so nice to feel good again, to feel, happy again to be able to smile to be able to to take enjoyment in the small things you know in Jehovah's creation and you know just be happy that I'm alive so yeah yeah now I have a stable job I work at a hardware store Man, I feel at peace. The adversities have made me stronger. And overall, I have a much closer relationship with Jehovah. But I'm still making bread. <laughs> and at home, yeah, I'm the one who irons the clothes. <laughs> I thought we were going to be in a scenario where he's like, yeah, now I opened my own bakery and it's doing super well. 
and uh, it's given me the opportunity to pioneer. No, nope. now I work in a hardware store and I still make bread and iron clothes, but just at home. So even this thing that he was trying to... I don't even understand why this example was in there. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I'm, I'm thoroughly confused. I don't know, man. It's wild. After a while, I found out that I was being deported. I remember getting off the train. They took me through the back door, but my wife, Jenny, was standing at the main entrance. She was on the phone. She couldn't see me. She was looking at the main entrance. And I threw my bag down <laughs> as I ran to her. <laughs> she could see from the corner of her eyes someone was running. She was a little confused, even scared. <laughs> And there I was. Hugging the person I loved the most. It was one of the most beautiful days of my life. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> When I heard that you were praying for us and for the brothers and sisters in Russia, it really encouraged me and Felix. It's such an example for me personally. We mentioned it in our prayer yesterday. Felix was saying that you are a great example of how we need to genuinely care for our brothers and sisters. We love you very much. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night meeting. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. I, I wasn't going to say it, but now I just have to. Isn't it just kind of weird? Be it's easy. Ow. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> I wasn't going to say anything, but I thought it was really odd that they're like, hey, why don't you go and talk to these people, even though you guys don't share any of the same language? Like, is there a translator in the room? Is that how this is going down? Like, why wouldn't you show the translator? Because they just start doing the VO and you're I'm I'm left at least wondering, OK, well, was there someone? I don't know. It just seemed very odd to me. My cancer is uncurable, but um, I know the cure is in the new system, so <laughs> that's the cure. I like to imagine when that time happens, what will I be doing? Obviously, I'm going to be jumping for joy because I'm going to be rid of my cancer. I'm going to enjoy food that we never really got to enjoy. and I'm going to have so many animals. So I'm going to make a house i'm gonna learn how to make a house um <laughs> peace in this world is not the absence of illness danger persecution or economic problems peace in this world is listening to jehovah's guidance praying to jehovah constantly meditating on Jehovah's word and his promises. Peace in this world is also having good friends by our side or having a good sense of humor. Well, what I've learned from all of this is peace isn't from what's outside from what's going on or what you're experiencing, I've learned that peace is on the inside and that, that comes from Jehovah. These are... The crucial thing that is missing here is that 
when you are a Jehovah's Witness, that means that you identify what the governing body tells you as being the words of Jehovah. And those words from Jehovah can put you in a greater risk for health complications. Listening to the governing body or Jehovah can put you in a worse financial situation. Listening to the governing body, Jehovah, can put you in a position where you're experiencing opposition. They are the ones that are causing the problems. They are the ones responsible for why a lot of this human suffering. Now, some things, yeah, true. Maybe they have nothing to do with someone losing their job or someone getting sick. Yes, that's true. But in a lot of cases, there is a direct correlation from listening to the governing body, Jehovah, and experiencing some of these same problems. So, when they've given this girl the script here, obviously this sounds scripted now, about, hey, here's the things you need to say, and you, whether you're facing these problems or this problem or this problem, it's fine. Just keep listening to Jehovah, the governing body, and that's how you find true peace and happiness. Tell that to the people that experience the problems you mentioned because of listening to Jehovah, the governing body.